Okay, welcome back for session three. We're talking about building construction as it relates to building collapse and the Florida Trust Law. And we've learned about the uh, five types of construction. And we've talked about the older style of legacy construction as it relates to the fire service and fire operations. We talked about the lightweight components being used today in a lot of our structures specifically structures that are uh, three, four stories or less, uh, residential, multifamily residential, strip malls, and those type of common occupancies in our area here in Sarasota County. And uh, so we, we have to look at these various components and see how they'll act under fire conditions. And as I said earlier, and as you see here in this summary table that we looked at in session two, time is your enemy. Time could be your friend, but time's normally going to be your enemy. So depending on the set, uh, system you have in place on uh, as far as a mark system to time when you arrive at the scene, uh, do you know, does your mark system start on dispatch or on arrival? And how long of a mark that is, like your first mark, your second mark, your third mark? Does anyone know when the clock actually starts? Okay, it probably starts at dispatch. In Manatee County, I know that's how we set that up, is it starts on, on dispatch. Now, some dispatchers will say, you're at your next mark. And as an incident commander, if you just say copy, that doesn't really tell you much. All right? So a dispatcher that's on the ball, or one that you may have to get on the ball by saying, tell me what mark I'm at. You're at your third mark. I got a 10 minute mark system. 30 minutes. I get a 15 minute mark system, 45 minutes. That gives me that indicator. So make the dispatcher tell you what mark you're at, otherwise it's not going to do you a lot of good. We also talked about this time frame and when does the clock start? Well, we don't really know that. We have to use all of our senses, we have to use reconnaissance, we have to use reports from officers to determine how many minutes have ticked by here with this particular fire situation and that's not going to be an exact science nor is this table. This table is just comparing uh, known materials under similar fire conditions and how long they will last. But we can't look at that blindly and say well 26 minutes is, is what this will, will last right here with a uh, wood eye joist with gypsum board protecting it. No we can't say that. We have to use all of what we have with our size up and the fire reports to determine when is it time to continue and when is it time to back out or go defensive or let's at least operate from a doorway so if a building collapses you're going to be pushed where? You're going to be pushed out in the street not underneath the collapse situation. So it's all about working smarter and learning I, I uh, heard this someplace, of which I, I wish I thought it up, but I didn't. But it, it says that uh, knowledge is not what you're taught. Knowledge is what you remember. So that's, that's only so much. I, I've been talking for about an hour and a half now, and we are not computers. And if you look at uh, where you, uh, instructor courses, you know that a lecture format, a person is not going to retain a lot of that knowledge. So what do we do? We use graphics, we use video, I offered where you can get some handout material through NIOSH and so forth. That's how you turn this information into knowledge, is to, is to take all those things and, and, and learn from them, but then you have additional resources in the future. Now you can look back on this video and check it out in a year and a half, oh, refresh your memory and so forth. Where you come upon a building and it looks like something you've seen here, then you can draw a slide in your head of, oh, that's right, we talked about that. So turn this into knowledge. With that said, does anyone have any uh, questions or you want to discuss anything with the building construction part of this before we move into start talking about the trust law? Is there anything specifically that you saw that you didn't understand or what about this situation or that that I might be able to, to uh, help you out with? Okay. Well, we'll go right into the... Aldridge Bang Firefighter Safety Act of 2008. Now, what occurred here was actually this was triggered 
as most laws and codes are, this was triggered by an event. The event was the, the sofa store fire in Charleston. And when I read the report on that, I noticed a lot of things had gone wrong there, and anybody familiar with that fire that killed nine firefighters knows a lot of things went wrong. It wasn't one thing. This happened, that happened. It was a lot of things that went wrong. But ultimately, the fire compromised the uh, bar joist truss system, and that ended up collapsing uh, in on that, that situation. And, and whether that's actually what killed the firefighters doesn't matter. But sooner or later, like I said earlier, if fire is impinging, on the structural components, sooner or later it's going to fall if it's allowed to continue like that. So that was kind of a little trigger there, and there's some of us uh, that talked about that in the training uh, group in Manatee County, and an email was sent to a local legislator asking them if they thought that maybe the state of Florida could have a system like other states that marks buildings with lightweight trust components that support floors or roof systems. So in New Jersey and in New York are the two that come to mind. They, uh, the the um, state of New Jersey uses a triangle and it has the, uh, the letters on there for roof or floor. And of course, when do you think that came about, that law? After a tragedy. Anybody know what tragedy that was? the Hackensack Ford fire that killed five firefighters, bowstring string trust collapse. So that's what drives a lot of these codes and laws and so forth. So uh, this particular state senator kind of liked the idea and, and uh, gave it to a committee member and so forth. And then it kind of started steamrolling from there. Uh, my chief, Randy Stolsey, took it to the State Fire Chiefs Association and their uh, political committee and they, uh, they took a look at it and supported that. The Florida Fire Marshals and Inspectors Association took a look at it and thought it was a good idea for fire, uh, fighter safety. And so those groups kind of pushed ahead with this. And uh, if, if you know anything about politics and the way things work in the state of Florida, uh, you have to have a bill in the House and you have to have a bill in the Senate that at the end they, they read the same. And if everybody approves that, then it goes to the governor for a signature. So, it took about two years or so for that to happen, but I can tell you that through all those uh, committee meetings and through the House vote and the Senate vote, there, there was not one nay vote. It, it was unanimous all the way through. And what this law said was, it said that the State Fire Marshal's Office shall develop a symbol to be placed on certain buildings that will warn firefighters of the existence of lightweight trust components for roof and or floor systems that may be subject to early failure during fire conditions. So basically that's what the bill said. And uh, Governor Chris signed that and the bill went into effect in December of 2009. Now the bill actually had a 45 day implementation period and I think any reasonable person would, would be able to identify that all the buildings that are supposed to be marked with this emblem is not going to happen in 45 days. So it's been um, almost a year and a half now and some departments are still gearing up and trying to get it done. It's going to take a couple years to get it done as is the case in Manatee County as the case in Sarasota County. So you'll, saw, you'll see these start springing up on certain buildings. So the buildings that are affected are the buildings that are subject to a fire inspection. So if you've been through inspector classes uh, you will know that any residential unit of three units or more, so that's a triplex or apartment building, anything with three units or more, a fire inspector in the state of Florida has the jurisdiction to, to inspect that, that building. Uh, all commercial buildings, all uh, institution buildings, industry, any other commercial building that a fire inspector is, uh, has jurisdiction over, this law applies to. This law is one that covers the entire state of Florida. This law will also cover any new construction. Get this sign off here, we'll take a look. So there's no grandfathering of this with older buildings. If it meets the 
uh, description of the, uh, the law, then they need to mark their building with this emblem. What it says is that if you have a wood or light frame steel support system for floors or roofs that has a repetitive system of triangles, a truss, then you need to mark your building. The State Fire Marshal's Office came up with this emblem, the, and, and what, what happens is the bill passes, it goes to the State Fire Marshal's Office, and then the State Fire Marshal's Office develops the language for the law. So the language for the law now says that it will be an 8-inch Maltese cross, it'll be red in color, it'll be reflective, and it'll be on a contrasting background. And it will have an R, if it's a roof system, it'll have an F if it's a floor system, or it'll have an RF if it has both, such as, say, a three-story apartment building where the floors are uh, lightweight truss, parallel cord truss, and then the roof is also a truss system. It says that this will be posted to the left of the main entrance door. It will be no further than 24 inches to the left of the door. It will be no lower than 4 feet, no higher than 6 feet. So as a general rule, we're looking at this being at the main entrance. However, as you know, not every building has a main entrance, and there's going to be buildings that that doesn't really fit too well. And we'll look at a couple of uh, those situations here in a couple minutes. But uh, there's also some problems with apartment buildings where there is no main entrance and or if the inspector or authority having jurisdiction in that area says, well, we're going to mark each building uh, at each doorway, it, it can get out of hand that way. So one of the things that's happening in this legislative session, there is a bill pending before the House and the Senate which will allow this emblem to be placed at the main entrance to complexes of like buildings is what it says so that means an apartment complex you got say 20 buildings they're all built the same they all have lightweight roof systems then you wouldn't have to mark you being the inspector or uh, rather the, the the building owners uh, would not have to mark every individual building they could put this at the sign out front that says you know Beneva Gardens or apartments or whatever it is there. They could put that on a sign at the front. Well, what if there's a back entrance? Well, we'll put one at the back entrance too instead of marking every building. So that's pending before the legislature right now. Also, uh, during this time period, there was a uh, request for a code interpretation in front of the Florida F uh, Fire Code Council in Daytona Beach last year where a building official said, well, I read the law and what it says and everything, and I want to know if steel bar joists are also included because the law says light frame steel, I'm sorry, it says light gauge steel and when I look at a steel bar joist that doesn't look like light gauge steel to me and the ruling was no that light gauge steel is not bar joist so right now bar joists are exempted from this but there are other type of steel truss systems that are used in construction that are out there. There's uh, channel steel, there's angle iron steel, there's hollow tube steel and so forth that also make up trusses. So there are some steel systems that would, would, would apply here, but right now bar joists are exempt, but the, the law that is uh, presently being uh, looked at in the legislature would include those bar joists because that was supposed to be the intent of the law, but due to the word gauge in there that uh, had a little problem. So. The, uh, the revision right now is to, is to make apartment complexes uh, where they don't have to mark every building and include the uh, steel bar joists. So you might think, well, what about shopping centers or big box stores and places like that? Uh, there is a provision in there for uh, strip malls where if it's longer than 100 feet long, they would put one at, at every 100 feet. So if you've got a 200 foot shopping center, there'll be one on each end facing the front and there will be one in the middle. If it was 190 feet long or 80 feet long, just depending, the law would, would let them know where to place this. So that's, that's what the law says and that's all the semantics of it which really don't, don't, uh, doesn't interest firefighters too much. What interests firefighters is how does this apply to, to me, you as a firefighter? So does anyone have any questions about all the specifics that I just talked about?
Okay? So now we'll get into, okay, how does it apply to us? There's a picture of uh, one of these signs in place at a business. Here you also see one at Bob Evans to the left of the door, main entrance door, four to six feet, no more than 24 inches away. Now, there's going to be some problems uh, that people will that need to deal with, the fire prevention and the building owners, but as far as us as firefighters, what does this mean? Okay, I've already identified that Mike has been on the job 14 months. So he's, he's been on the job the least of anyone here, so we're going we're gonna to use Mike as our nozzle firefighter. So you're on an engine. That day, you're on a nozzle. We come up to a strip mall. The fire is in a... Uh, a uh, party goods type store. It's only uh, 50 foot wide. It's 120 foot deep. And what is usually at the back of these stores in those rooms in the back? Office. Yeah, your office and stock and stuff. So it looks to me that we got a fire in that back room. And what we're going to do is we're going to get you ready with your crew. And we're going to have a crew go, go around back. And they're going to open that back door. And when they, when they say we got it vented out the back, then we're going to push in on this fire. We're going to go in and we're going to probably just push this thing right out the back. So you're all set to go. Nobody stole your nozzle from you, so you're good to go. And you're kneeling there. Okay. And the lieutenant behind you says, okay, Mike, let's go. And you look up and you see this emblem to the left of the door there. Okay. Are you, as a nozzle firefighter, really going to do anything drastically different, Mike? Not particularly. No. I'll have it in the back of my mind. Okay. What, what might you, you do, though, uh, or who might you tell? Let the lieutenant know. Okay. Be aware of that. Okay. Going to let the lieutenant know. Hey, lieutenant, did you see the sign? Yep, I got it, Mike. Okay. And really, as a firefighter, a nozzle firefighter, that's, that's all that he's going to do different. He's just going to notify the lieutenant, hey, we've got a lightweight truss roof system on this building. The sign's right there, Louie. Okay, great. So... Good, great. Okay, Lieutenant here, you're behind him, and Mike tells you, hey, you see the sign. You see the sign. Uh, what might you do a little different? Well, I would try and let Command know. This Number is one, right. right there, let Command know, right? Command be advised. We're ready to make entry to firefighters, uh, Kingsley and Boyer. We got a lightweight roof truss system sign on this building. Okay, what else, Lieutenant? Well, we have an understanding. We, we looked into the, uh, the situation with the furniture fire, and I'm going to take a thermal imager and check for temperature at the ceiling as we advance to make sure Excellent. We don't have some awesome. Numbers. Okay, so before he goes in, gets that imager, takes a look above his head. Keep in mind what I said earlier. All trusses are a hazard when they're exposed to fire, but wood trusses, especially, are going to add to the fire load above our head. Okay? Metal trusses won't. You'll still collapse on us. But now we've got more fire load. So what else might you do before you push in on this fire? We Depending on the smoke situation, yeah. whether what you know would determine how much you can see, but go ahead. I was gonna say we could expose some of the ceiling a little bit. All right. Move. See that? And we didn't script this. This is this is this is right from the from the man here. That's exactly what you need to do. Depending on the smoke situation, if it's to the floor. And that's going to be different. But if you got some hazy smoke rolling around up here, you grab your pike pole, push the ceiling tile back, take a look. It's going to tell you a couple things. Number one, is there fire above our heads? Number two, is you, you might be able to see if it's steel bar joist or if it's wood for the reasons we just mentioned. Now, if it's a stock room and office burning in the back, it may or may not have gotten up into that void. That might be clear up there. And I'll give a, I'm going to give you an example here in a little bit. But that's excellent. That's exactly what a lieutenant on a hose line should do when they recognize there's a lightweight system involved here in this fire. We're going to notify command. We're going to take an imager, check up above us, and see what kind of temperatures we're getting. And if possible, take a look. And other than that, anything else come to mind? Okay. Search. Okay, just going in, doing our search, pushing that fire out the back, should be no problem. 
all done, everybody comes down, high five, hey, that was great, you know, did a good job and all that. So that's the way it's supposed to work. So now, to the incident commander, Mike is told by the lieutenant, we got a lightweight roof system on his building and he knows what's going on, he can see what's going on, he knows what's happening and so forth. So as an incident commander, what might you do different or what considerations do you now want to consider, Chief, on this? Well, first off, I want to say let's hold up a second. Let's get a look at this. Let's get some more information from maybe the Charlie side of the building, see what they have once they've opened up that door, uh, work in collaboration with the lieutenant to get that conversation going. Uh, the communication has to be really good to know what he has and what he's experiencing when he's entering from the uh, Alpha side. Okay. How so. about, uh, so, yeah, so get that, get mo as much information as you can because you're going to be basing your decisions on that. How about the timelines and so forth? Well, I definitely want to know what my timeline is, where, what, what mark I'm at, if I'm 10 minutes into this thing um, from the dispatch, uh, maybe if I can gather some information of when that fire started, who called it in, all of that information from people outside the bystanders, anything that's going to give me more clues to how long the fire has been going, how much extension I have, uh, what started the fire, where the fire started at, and what, what I'm experiencing back there, whether it's uh, an open plan for the ceiling or if it's an enclosed ceiling acoustic tile or something to that effect. So any of that information that I can gather would help. Okay, let's talk about extension because in any fire situation when you get the fire knocked down the next thing you're going to be doing is looking for extension. This is why. This is why. We're looking to see if it is attacking the structural components of the building. And I know for a fact that the chief here, if he, don't, if he doesn't hear it, he's going to be asking it. Hey, has the fire extended into the truss area? Uh, do, do you know, like you said, gathering information, reconnaissance? Do you know, are they steel trusses, are they wood trusses, things like this? And then keeping track of that time clock, that mark system, to know how long you've been operating in that building. And then, as I think we summarized a little bit ago, okay, well, if the chief's not feeling real comfortable, keep in mind, in most commercial fires, the life hazard is to who? Who? Us, okay? Very few fire deaths in commercial occupancies do, or, or to civilians. So we got, we got the burden on our back. If we're sure there's no one in there, and uh, the only hazard is to us, and it's not looking good, and we're looking at a situation where you've got a lot of smoke pushing out under the eaves of this thing, or you've got angry smoke, or the velocity of the smoke's looking bad, and you've got guys in there operating, you could tell they're not, it's not getting it. It looks like they got fire up over their heads, maybe. Then the incident commander is going to make that decision of either we're going to go defensive, or hey, let's pull out to the doorway and put a deck gun in there, make sure we don't have that huge facade over our head. If we do, we'll pull beyond that, and you know, let's do what we can with this thing. But um, but it looks like a loser, and that's the main decision on on these truss emblems and so forth is going to rest with the incident commander, because they're the ones that are making the decision. Based, based on everything that they know, everything they've been taught, everything they're seeing, and all the information that they're receiving. Okay? So keep that in mind. I got ahead of myself. We've already talked about it. We've got the firefighter, the engine officer, and the incident commander. Now, some of the problems with the placement of these, because there's no law you know, or code that is going to be great and everybody's going to be happy and everything's going to work wonderfully. What might be a potential problem on the left there with the, what, this emblem being on glass there? Although it meets the code, uh, maybe. There's no contrasting background on that. So uh, other than that, what, what's the potential problem there? Glass could break. Window. Yeah, that glass could be gone the time we get there. So just like thermal imagers, we don't, we don't want to lay our life on the line for a thermal imager. It's just another tool. This is just another tool. But we, you know, it's not an exact science. Look at the one on the right. I got a signboard there blocking that emblem. It's probably not four feet off the ground. Looks close, but um, there's going to be problems like this. Tell you about an incident that a couple incidents. One of the, the first one that I uh, came upon uh, structure fire call. I responded as safety officer as I do. And when I rolled up with safety, it was at uh, Summerfield Retirement Home. And I looked, and to the left of the main door, 
there was a roof truss emblem. All I said was, uh, command from safety, be advised, we got a lightweight roof truss emblem on this building. That's it. The guys are going in, investigating the fire, see what's going on. But the incident commander just got it locked away in case things develop here and they're not going well, then that's one more tool to use. We had a fire several months ago at a Chinese restaurant. It was in the morning, about eight or nine in the morning, and had multiple calls for a uh, fire in a Chinese restaurant on Cortez Road. If you're familiar with the area, right by Home Depot, there's a strip mall right there. Home Depot runs this way and a strip mall is back here. And so when we left the station and there was an acting battalion chief, which a lot of times acting positions, there's, there's, there's some differences there too because people are not used to act, you know, being in that position. So a lot of case histories where there's acting officers, there's some mistakes made and so forth. Well, in this case, we had, a, we had an acting officer, but he's very experienced. And uh, when I rolled on down there, right in the middle of this 300-foot strip mall is the Chinese place. And there's flames ripping about 30 feet in the air out the middle of this place. So I'm not, I know how deep it is because I've been there many times. It's probably about 120 foot deep. But I couldn't tell from the front how deep the flames were. You know, is it in the back of the store or is it in the middle? It wasn't in the front. So I went right to do a 360 in my vehicle as safety officer. Uh, went down an alley on the D Delta side, almost ran head on into the battalion because he's doing a 360 in his vehicle, but he's coming the other way. So we pass and I get an eyeball on, it's right in the middle. It's right in the middle of this store or this restaurant. So uh, we go around front, we start setting up, we got units in the back, hit the sprinkler system and so forth. And uh, this fire is not getting any better. And so uh, in evaluating this, the decision was made that we were going to get set up with a, a portable ground monitor at the front and the back because this looked like a loser. But when we had crews and they went up to the front door, it's all clear inside. What's that tell you? Where's the fire? Yeah, it's up above. So at that point, I would have bet you $1,000 that they were wood trusses, that it was probably a, a, a kitchen fire in the grease duct area that got up got out of the grease duct and got into those trusses because it just there was a lot of flames uh, coming out of the roof of this place. And um, so we went in there, we took a look, we got a long pike pole and the crews put a ceiling tile to the side and it's basically clear up there. And what it was, it was one of those huge air conditioner systems, probably 10 feet by 10 feet, and that's all it was burning in there. So. Looks can be deceiving, even with that, because like I said, I would have bet $1,000 the trusses are burning in this thing, and that wasn't the situation. So we went ahead and moved in on it and, and put the fire out and so forth. But uh, a lot of these type of truss systems and so forth, you really got to look and see what you have and get that opened up. As the lieutenant said, take a look with your imager or take a look if you can and see what's up there, see what's burning and so forth. But don't be fooled. Don't, uh, don't be complacent. With that said, uh, we're just about out of time on session three. Does anyone have any questions about the trust bill? Or you as a firefighter, officer, incident commander, how, how it relates to your operation out there in the street? I must have covered it well then. Does anyone think that because this sign is on a building that there's no interior firefighting going on? negative okay this is a tool we use this as one more tool in our toolbox to help us in our job and like I said knowledge is the key if you have knowledge you have power so you need to use all these tools to your advantage and keep in mind the intent of this whole two-hour time that we spent together was for you to operate safer in the streets there in the days months and, and years to come you never know when you're going to have that job. It could be in an hour. It could be next week. It could be uh, down the road a ways where, uh, where people are endangered and so forth. So just do your best to operate safely. And uh, that's what it's all about. So with that, I just want to thank the Sarasota County Fire Department, uh, Chief of Training Easton, Captain Treffinger for inviting me allowing me to share this information with uh, the crews here. Just, uh, just 
got a great career. Stay out there and stay low. Back. 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 Back.